Thank you, Bill. Thank you. And uh, I'm impressed that you're all here this morning this early, and I'm sure some of you threw up sails and were blown here. Um, it's a pleasure to kick this off, and I was trying to think of the best way to talk about where we are right now with water. And uh, one of the things in, in my career is that uh, 39 years ago right now, and believe me, it's hard to believe that uh, that's how long it's been since I was a college student or a university student. I wrote my undergraduate thesis on the history of water development in California. And <clears throat> I'm, happy with that. Uh, uh, I'm very carefully embargoing that. <laughs> um, but the thing about it was is that I've never been far away from water in the in the time since. But if you look at where we were then and where we are now, there have been these fundamental changes in thinking, in the issues, in sort of how the table is set for water issues in California. Because uh, at that time, it was about 10 years after the bonds were uh, approved by the voters to establish the California Water Project, and yet it wasn't fully in place. It was really uh, a little later that decade that that happened. There was no CEQA. There was no uh, Endangered Species Act. It wasn't until sometime, I think, in the late 80s that the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California changed their view about underground storage. They were very skeptical. They didn't believe in it. It was a pitch fight. And interestingly, when uh, a water Armageddon sort of happened three or four years ago where the Colorado River was in the eighth year of, of drought, there was 28% of normal rainfall in the LA Basin. Uh, a judge turned off the, the pumps from the Delta. It was that investment that saved them in many ways with a million and a half acre feet underground. When I wrote my thesis, the operating political coalition in California was really Central Valley Ag and urban Southern California. That's what drove water politics. And uh, the land patterns in some places were very big. If you look at three maps of the Westlands Water District, uh, there were originally three large landowners People have it stuck in their minds. That's the way the land patterns were. And yet, when the federal government did reforms uh, about 25 years ago that allowed subsidized water only up to something like 1,060 acres or somewhere in that thing, even though some of them are brothers-in-laws or, or arms-length family members, the land patterns changed in a way that it was more diverse in that area. And in conservation, which, which Rita mentioned, even when I first got to the state legislature, <clears throat> conservation was viewed by many people in the water world is the excuse some people had for not supporting dams. <laughs> they weren't really for conservation, but it was the way of having some affirmative position. And that has fundamentally changed. And, and you look at the city of Los Angeles, uh, which has grown by a million people in the last generation, all on the same amount of water. So the, they have had their fundamental shift where uh, conservation and efficiency is what has allowed for their growth in the last few decades. And that's true in the broader Southern California region. So all those things have changed. The political coalition that governed has realigned in in some different ways, and uh, it led to the water agreement in 2009. And one of the, re or, you know, in the last session, one of the reasons that people are starting to move on water is not all these fundamental changes in thinking, but the fact that if you look at the Delta, which is the hub of California water, uh, something like two-thirds of Californians get their water where it originates in the Sierra, and most of them get it just before it flows into the Delta or after it flows through the Delta, the same two-thirds. And the status quo is finally to the point that it is an unacceptable project alternative, that if nothing is done for Delta restoration, 
uh, it will, in essence, be an inland salton sea by the end of the century. If climate change is truly the way some people project it, and the Sierra snowpack by the end of the century is roughly half of what it is now, and that's what two-thirds of Californians get their water, we better be thinking differently uh, about at least how you operate the current system, much less whether the current system provides water in the uh, right places to the right people. And if the Delta crashes, or uh, frankly, when there's a major earthquake, uh, there could be as long as a three-year interruption of water supply out of the Delta uh, in a uh, normal year. That's 50% of the water to the Silicon Valley, an incredible worldwide economic engine. Uh, if that's in a drought time, that's roughly 90% of the water that might be coming into the Silicon Valley. And so you just look at everything that is the way we are right now, and I think there's not a person across the water spectrum that doesn't understand we have to fundamentally make major decisions and plan for our future in a different way than the system has been set up now. And so that puts you right where we are. And the, uh, the governor campaigned uh, in the election on support of the dual goals that were part of the legislative package. And what the legislative package did, it did a lot of things, but one, the, one of the more significant things is it enshrined into law the fact that there are co-equal dual goals for going forward in the water plan, and that is habitat restoration and operating the delta scientifically. Okay? The second one is water reliability, determining what reliably can be taken from the delta uh, to serve the people that receive water from it. And when it's said that they're co-equal, it, it really means that you can't have one without the other. And uh, I've had a lot of fun speaking to different groups of stakeholders, basically saying everybody is firmly committed to one of those goals. <laughs> <laughs> and, and everybody has to get used to the fact that to achieve the one goal they're firmly committed to, they have to believe in the second goal, and that has to be achieved at the same time. If we can operate the Delta scientifically, meaning certain times there's the right flows for fish, certain times there's the right flows for uh, the temperature of the water for the fish, that we figure out how to protect against seawater intrusion from the estuary of the San Francisco Bay, uh, we do the things that we need to do to deal with the delta, then we can determine a, while, a reliable water amount, and then is there a discussion of the conveyance or a cross delta facility, because we have achieved the first goal to get to the second goal, and then have that discussion. Uh, I spoke to a statewide ag group a couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> and they sent to me beforehand, they said, here are the questions we'd like you to answer. Uh, and I'm going to exaggerate a little, but it was basically the way I read the questions. It was like, well, there are certain people that if you enact the flows they want through the Delta, you can't take a drop of water for uh, uh, use by a water thing. What do you think? And, uh, and basically, how are we going to pay for this? And can we have a big pipe in conveyance coming across the Delta? And I gave them a similar introduction that I've just given you and said that basically um, we have to work from that direction there. And then the answers to all your questions are evident. And if somebody wants to talk to me about a pipe, yes, we'll take the scientific studies as part of determining the science to know soil samples, where it might go, so that the scientific work or the engineering prep work is done to answer questions when we answer all the questions together. But it's premature to have those discussions because it might be any of a number of ways sequentially that when you determine what the delta means, it tells you when there might be flows. And if the flows are such 
that you can take water in a relatively even manner a significant amount of time of the year, then a big pipe is, is not necessarily necessary. If it turns out that you can only take flows in really heavy peak flow times, then you want, want probably a bigger capacity because you're taking your entire year's allotment and, and you want it when that is going on. And if you sort of address those questions after the science and then you deal with the beneficiaries and the beneficiaries say, <laughs> we're sorry, we can only spread the cost so far and we can only afford a pipe that's up to this level. Although the latest discussions show that the costs aren't as dramatically different as some people uh, originally thought. But that is an appropriate sequence in a decision-making fashion to look at this. And if you look at the Schwarzenegger administration and sort of what they did to bring things to this point, uh, they were moving at a high rate of speed uh, with the Delta, uh, Bay Delta Conservation Plan. And they were moving at the high rate of speed because they had a deadline of December 31st of last year. And it was they were gone after that. And they were determined to do everything they could and maybe get somewhere by that deadline. And as a result, the deadlines became more important than the product. And while they've come up with some good products, they were really under that deadline. And now it's upon us, as the new Brown administration, to basically say, we want the best possible product, even though we won't want to slip deadlines, but we have to bring people along. And the initial sort of process for doing that plan involved the biggest contractors, water contractors, in the contract role. And they've stepped up in a good way. They have put the money up for the process. Uh, they've participated in the governance. But however we come out of this, we're going to have to have the broadest possible support. If something is required to go to the voters, we're going to have to have as many interest groups bought into this as possible to be able to take it and pass it. And so our strategy is to involve as many people as possible in key parts of this to be able to try to develop that constituency. <coughs> so even though the administration hasn't moved incredibly rapidly, on some of the appointments to departments and uh, uh, positions during the transition, uh, I was in place the first day, and I put in place the deputy director for water resources the first week. And it's Jerry Merrill, who was deputy director of water in the first at Brown administration, former head of the Planning and Conservation League. He's going to move ahead on the Bay Delta process. And between him and I, my assistant was trying to count it last week. I think we've had at least 300 meetings between the two of us on water since January 5th. And we have really tried to work our way through major stakeholders. And, and frankly, we've really worked through a lot of minor stakeholders. And the, the thing that has started to make me crazy the last few weeks is I'm having second meetings with people where somebody came in the first time and said, well, I was wearing my Central Valley flood control hat the first time. This time I'm with the North Delta Water Agencies. And, uh, and yet we're working through everyone uh, uh, because we want them to know that we're on top of this, we're trying to make the transition seamless, and we feel like uh, we have one of those unique windows in California history uh, to be able to make major progress on water. and. As somebody that's been a student of it for at least roughly 40 years, I always thought the only time you could really make a tough water decision for the future was in the second term of a two-term governor. Uh, they're not going to run for re-election. Uh, their legacy is in the balance, not their next election. Uh, they'd be prepared to make tough decisions. And so I was a little nervous about the fact that while progress was made with the water deal in the legislature, Governor Schwarzenegger left without a deal on the Delta and, and sort of the future. And this governor uh, is determined, if he, you know, he may well run for a second term. And in his inauguration, he introduced a 99-year-old aunt to make sure everybody knew. 
uh, uh, that there were longevity genes in the family, and you better get used to it and accept the fact that uh, you don't write him off. But at the same time, I think he's acting on a lot of things, where it's trying to upright the budget in five months, uh, or whether it's trying to deal with water, as if we've got four years to do it. And so we are determined uh, to move ahead. And I think the 